sometimes if you're part of the human race, which I imagine you are if you're watching this video, that you're not a monkey or a baboon, you know, or you know, come from one too, but <laughs> but that you're human like most of us, then you're gonna discover that there are times where it doesn't matter what you do, that there are lots of things going on that are bigger than you, that have more of an effect on you than you can control. That there are things that are completely beyond your ability to understand, your ability to comprehend, or in any way, shape, or form, your confidence to be able to say, I know now why that happened. There are some things that are just going to be beyond you. And that's why we have faith. Because we have faith in a person, not faith in faith. We don't have this blind faith that says, hey, you know, I just know that somehow it'll all work out. No, that's not the kind of faith we have. Because if that were the faith we have, we'd be a fatalist or we'd be a coincidental kind of circumstantial Christian, which isn't what God said. God said, have faith in me, trust in me with all your heart, be not in my, thy own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge me and I will direct your path. In other words, we can't put our faith that in the sweet by and by we'll know the reason why. No, that's not the way it works. We can't say, oh, well, I know that all things are going to work out for the best. No, you can't. All things work together for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. The best is your interpretation of it. You see, there's a lot of humanism that's out there that wants to make God into a sugar daddy or God somehow not able to discipline his children or to do things that he said, I am the Lord thy God, follow thou me. And that somehow we lose sight of that because we think if we just do this, we'll get this. Or if we just be good, we'll be righteous. It doesn't work that way. You see, we deal with a holy God. We deal with the God of love. And God in his love, being greater than we are, is going to accomplish his purposes, no matter who we are and no matter what we say or do. So as much as people like to put themselves in God's position to play God for a while, there are times when your life where it's just going to be like, bam, suddenly you hit a brick wall and you go, man, what happened? I thought I was doing so good. You know, and maybe you were doing, quote, good, but it wasn't God. You see, God can still do anything he wants to do. He has said to us certain promises and assurances that we like to cling to with our faith and say, oh, oh no, the, the mountains be removed and the, the mountains be cast into the sea and the things removed. And where shall I put my faith? But I have to trust in God. And then you go, oh, wow, okay. Well, that's a good place to put your trust. <laughs> because after all, God is in control. Whether it be a tornado, a hurricane, a flood, uh, cancer, death, dying, suffering. What are you worried about? It's God. Let's get real. I mean, if you go through suffering, praise the Lord. If you don't go through suffering, praise the Lord. If you go through devastation, praise the Lord. If you don't go through devastation, praise the Lord. In other words, do you kind of get the picture? There's something bigger that's controlling the big picture. So don't be surprised if at times that your apple cart <laughs> suddenly is full of peaches. <laughs> Whoops. Or you don't have a cart at all, you know, and you're just kind of like pushing your shopping cart along you know, carrying all your possessions. I thought I had, you know, security in the stock market. <laughs> yeah, wrong investment. But the point is, is that God will bring you to himself if you will seek him with all your heart. And that's what we have to always do every day is to seek to follow the Lord and not the circumstances or our feelings. Because as we trust him, as we follow him, as we learn from him, we discover that though he may chastise us at times, though he may cause us to go through a certain amount of suffering, it is something that God's will is always best for us. It's not it's the best, it's God's will is for us. 
that he will bring about to us what his plan is for us and that we can trust him it pleased the Lord to bruise him he hath put him to grief now is my soul troubled and what shall I say father save me from this hour but for this hour came I into this world father glorify your name then came there a voice from heaven saying oh I have both glorified it and will glorify it again father if thou be willing remove this cup from me nevertheless not my will but thine be done and there appeared an angel unto heaven from heaven strengthening him being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again for I came down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him that sent me the cup which my father has given me shall I not drink it the father has not left me alone for I do always those things that please him my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. God's will is not your will. That's the bottom line. God can choose to literally put you to death if he so chooses. And if you're obedient to Jesus, if you're obedient to God, if you are willing to allow God to do his will, then even as the Son has suffered, so too you may go through that time of suffering there is a time coming upon the world when all hell will break loose and it will happen in our generation now to those that aren't ready and prepared they will despair and even kill themselves they will turn from the living God and choose gods fashioned after themselves and soulless in drugs and alcohol and pot and all kinds of alternatives to seek to alleviate the stress of nations, the distress that's coming upon the world that God said would cause men to despair, that they would even cry out to the rocks to hide them, that they would try to kill themselves and at one point in time God even takes death away. How miserable can that be when you could even cut your throat or chop off your head and you're not dead? That's sad because you see at some point in time you must turn to the living God you must accept his will for your life whether it be for life or for death whether it be for suffering or whether it be for rejoicing whatever so it be that God has determined in our own choices that we've made that he has planned out our way then we must accept it that he is the one who knows what's best and that should you go into tribulation as you may not hear that from other people who know that there is a rapture should you go into tribulation then accept it as God's will because it's nevertheless not your will but God's will be done for such as it is that God has determined that there are seven letters to seven churches and not all seven go into the rapture not all seven are reassured that they will be spared the great tribulation not all are told that they would not go through severe serious suffering and die as a matter of fact, some of them are told they will go into the Great Tribulation period. So don't be surprised if God's will is the cup that Jesus drank from and it's offered to you to do the same. Would you reject that or would you accept that? For whatsoever cup that it is that God causes you to go through, whether for blessing or curse or whether for challenges or suffering or whether the time of wrath or the time of blessing, God's Spirit has prepared you for that time. For you were born for such a time as this, that you shall accomplish your purpose, whether it be unto God for the glory of His name, as Jesus prayed, let thy world glory be made, thy glory be made known. And God says, I will glorify it, that He would give the strength to be able to do. Or whether it be for falling away, which I pray you would not be one of those. The choice, in reality, is yours to accept, as Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, to do the will of the Father, or to reject it. It's serious stuff. We live in the last generation. We have, as it were, the day to choose which way 
So that's why we pray for each and every day. That today let us hear his voice and harden not our heart, as it says in the provocation. So we would do and move according to his will. So we would be not caught unawares, but prepared for these times that are coming upon the world to try them. You are being tested. You are being tried. You are being determined whether you will follow God's will or reject God's will and be rejected. You that are the Lord's remembrance, keep not silence. Thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests. The sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow with the trumpets, and they shall be to you for an ordinance forever throughout your generations. And if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses you, then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and you shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, Seek me in vain. Their voice was heard, and their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place, even unto the heavens. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. Pray for one another. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Come, Lord Jesus, make no tarrying, O my God. Look for and abide in the hastening unto the coming of the day of our God. And you know, I think about that. And people sometimes kind of ask me, well, you know, there's been all this stuff about, you know, the camping last year and 2012 this year. And when do you think the Lord will return? And I tell them, your children aren't going to grow up. And they look at me like, oh no, don't say that. How horrible. And I looked them straight in the eye and say, no, how merciful. Do you really want this to go on? Can you look at the world and its ways and say that it's better today than it was yesterday? Is the world getting better or worse? Because if you added up the cost and consequence of every action that mankind does in order to make his life more acceptable to himself, what are we doing to the world and the population as we get bigger and better at destroying things? Are we making it better for those that have come after us or worse in the sense that there isn't a solution to what's going to happen to the world. We have caused a lot of our own grief and our own misery, even as we now recognize it, we try to repair and fix and change things back. Ooh, maybe we ought to have an Earth Day, you know, to repair some of the things that we kind of taken for granted. You know, like it's starting to kill us. Oh, maybe we better change things. Is it global warming? No. But there is climate change. So do we adapt to it or do we deny it? Do we try to make it work for us or do we actually recognize there are people in the world suffering today from it? The choice is ours to recognize we're in the last generation. There is no time left. We can live according to the will of God and accomplish his purposes or we can reject the fact that Jesus is coming again. And if we do, then we are deceived because the lie has been told and is out there that Jesus will not come for the next 10, 20 years. And I say unto you that this generation will not pass away until they see all things fulfilled. You will see Jesus return, whether it be in the rapture or whether it be in the second coming. You will see Jesus return. Whether you die today or you die tomorrow, because no man knows the day or the hour that he will return, nor do you know the day or the hour that you shall die and see Jesus face to face. Because the instant that you close your eyes in death and this physical body has put on internal, etern eternality, in other words, step out of the physical being that you are and you suddenly your soul and your spirit is freed up to recognize eternity, then guess what? When you're in that dimension, you suddenly know that this physical world was passing away and there wasn't much to it. And that now there's eternity either in heaven or in the lake of fire. For this corruption must put on incorruption in order to exist in that place where God is. And where God isn't is only one place he's created as a separation from himself. That the angels that rebelled against his authority would be placed there. And that no soul was ever determined to have done anything so bad as to warrant hell. 
but rather all corruption was to be placed in hell, and all corruption was to be determined to be cast into the lake of fire, to be separated from corruption, from incorruption. So that with which God has created incorruptible would remain forever, and he shall cause the heavens and the earth to pass away with a fervent heat to create incorruption once again. And that corruptible part will be gone and will be in the lake of fire forever in torment. Serious stuff. Seriously, though. We choose every day whether to obey like Jesus did in the garden and be strengthened by an angel sent from God, a messenger, even as I'm a messenger to you, to encourage you, to exhort you, to say, read your Bible, study the Word of God. Listen to God's voice. Walk with Him today. Accept His mercy and grace while you have the opportunity. Because according to your actions and your words and your deeds and a lot of what's said out of your own mouth, as well as what you write, possibly on texting or internet, and the very idle words that have come out of you, you'll be held accountable. As each every man shall be. And we'll all give an accounting for our lives. We don't always do and have good days. Some days we have bad days. But because you know and you've been told, because you've heard and it's been said, you must live according to grace and mercy. You must operate according to love and forgiveness. You must find that this Jesus, who has given his life, not only as an example for us to follow after, but as the propitiation for our sin as the price paid for all of our sins you must act according to his words that he's told us to do because he did only those things that were pleasing to his father and that's what we must do today we must choose to follow Jesus in a humble simple sober way in these last days we must live according to love and love everyone literally we must find that fruit of the Spirit in our lives and develop it. We must be merciful to those who need mercy because they're going to hell. We must be gentle and kind. We must be considerate and compassionate. We must have mercy in order to receive mercy. And we must have grace in order to give grace. For as we give grace that we've been given, then we shall receive grace. For it is mercy for mercy, grace for grace, and forgiveness for forgiveness. For if you forgive not your brother who sinned, and you forgive not the enemy even, then how will you be forgiven when you stand before 